where it kind of then gets a bit tricky is obviously when Cambridge Cambridge come up. In terms of the rules of the boat race, you can have as many warnings as you like. However, like if there is then contact caused by one crew going into another crew's water, which then impedes the other crew and could change the the result of the race, that's when we start getting kind of contentious disqualifications and things like that. It's right. called a foul. Yeah. in the boat race and i think sometimes it can be really confusing to people watching if they're hearing cambridge 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 or oxford 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 and they're like why why haven't yeah, they yeah. Be dis- been disqualified yeah. yet and it's because a foul in the boat race is very very specific yeah. it's physically contacting another crew it's causing a crab probably that directly impacts the outcome of that race um, and so that is a much much narrower decision than any international racing and and any Henley racing we will have ever seen. Hey, what is up? Welcome to the anniversary episode of Last Show Counts. Yes, it has been a year since we started doing this podcast and I'm very pleased to announce that we've got a star panel full of stars. We've got Imogen Grant and Erin Kennedy on the show to talk about the boat race that just happened two days ago and very pleased to talk about the events and yeah, we wanted to give a shout out to a few of our patron supporters and people who have uh, bought us a coffee. We wanted to give a shout out to David Yates, Nico Wright and Alan Prendergast. Thanks so much for supporting. And also a special shout out to Juliet Perry for helping us get the library on Easter Monday. Yeah. And Ross Hunter, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah There's a few people involved in getting this one, obviously, filming on Easter Monday, so no one else is around. But um, rowers don't have uh, <laughs> bank holidays off, so you guys have been training. Yeah, I was going to be like, bank holiday what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Three sessions down. Yeah, it's not a thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you guys don't really need an introduction. Obviously, we've had you both on the podcast before. You guys have been all over the, the commentary and BBC, Sky Sports and stuff as well. So, um, yeah, really, really excited to have you. Glad we've got Cox as well, based on, on some of the experience that's, that we've had or some of the races um yeah so to get into it so it's 11 races overall including all the reserve races and the two vets races last year cambridge won everything so obviously the hope was that some of that would get overturned oxford won two so they won the reserve women's uh open women's boat race and they won the reserve like the reserve four um other than that cambridge won everything again nearly It, it was an improvement yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll be sure to quash it the next yeah. year <laughs> but no in in all seriousness i mean this only survives because it's exciting and because it's yeah. competition mm-hmm. and the pendulum always swings yeah. so i think it was good to see fierce racing from oxford and seeing those crews really step up yeah definitely i think from the outside it seemed like quite a lot more hype was generated for this event purely because oxford has had some like internal changes over the last year so even on the on the BBC coverage, we could like talk about a bit more what happened with uh, who's the favourite for the race and that kind of thing. So that was interesting to like see, like definitely one that I was like bracing for for in a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think also the nature of the event, like being the two two boat race, um, the finish verdicts can be not necessarily like show the full story. Yeah. Although I sort of I look back at this because we spoke about it briefly before. I think. Um, so the women, so just for the two at the top, obviously. So the women's boat race was twenty-one minutes. That took the verdict was seven lengths. We've worked that out as like one point one percent difference in speed. For the men's eighteen fifty-six, three and a half lengths, given as the final difference, that's zero point six percent speed difference. And so those even, are still big margins yeah. when you talk about boat races. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, oh, what's he going to take to overturn it? Not a lot, like, uh, you know, although the verdicts can look big, I think sometimes, like, the difference is quite small. Um, So just to briefly go over it, so, like, so the men's heavyweight reserve pair, Cambridge won by two and a half lengths. The men's lightweight reserve pair, I didn't have a um, a verdict. I think it was probably an easily. Mm -hmm. The women's reserve four, again, didn't see a verdict. It said it was very close to the line. Yeah, I think it was two and a half lengths or something like that. Um, All of the Spurs races are actually really exciting. Um, It was held earlier in the week. Mm -hmm. Um, and boat race week in general was choppy as it was really, really windy. And the smallest boats, I think, had the roughest water. And I think in all of the spares races, um, I might be completely wrong, but I think 
the lead changed hands in all of yeah, them. Yeah. Um, they're really exciting. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to give a special shout out to Sierra, who stroked the Oxford Women's Reserve for. Is one of the athletes that I've taught how to row a couple of years ago. That's really it's nice. Fun. Yeah, I, I also just think it's really good that we're having actual spares races and it's competitive um, because, you know, those athletes are probably going to be kind of, you know, some of the kind of key people who potentially mm. stay on, you know, those development athletes. And it's it's a good opportunity for the clubs um, to basically have more depth um, because fundamentally, you know, we need it, like especially – I mean, Oxford's a little bit behind Cambridge, but this year was the first year that they were all racing as OUBC. So particularly, on, I know on the women's side and amalgamating the lightweight eight, then we've kind of got then that that extra level of reserve, which I just think is really, I think it's a really positive thing. Yeah, and you always forget at this point because it's been so long, but the reserve races didn't used to exist because it used to just be the Blue Boats and Spurs. And then the Spurs got competitive and went, hey, we'd quite like to race. And uh, the Blondie Osiris race, I think, started as fours and then became eights as the clubs grew in competitivity and quality and depth. And now we're seeing that with the spare pairs and spare fours as well. Yeah, I think anyone who's run a program knows you can't run in it. You can't run a fantastic eight with eight people. Mm-hmm. I mean, even 16 throughout the whole year is, is tight. So, yeah, having the ability to like bring a bigger squad through, have more people like get to race is really important for the top end. From a coaching standpoint as well, getting all your athletes, giving all your athletes an opportunity to race in the event and kind of like get to know the course and sort of if they're going to be racing the following year, just that experience, I think is going to be very handy for them too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. yeah just yeah. as an example, uh, Luca Ferraro, who has now won two boat races and been in three blue boats, at his first year trialing, uh, he was in the spare pair oh. and he went spare pair to blue boat in, in a season. Glow up. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, we'll get into it later as well, but obviously the, the uh, Cambridge women's boat race had six six blondie and two returners, um, and they sort of mentioned that. But yeah, we'll get into that a bit later. Uh, just briefly as well, mention the, the vets. So uh, again, Cambridge uh, beat the men uh, three quarters of a length, and in the women's it was given as a dead heat. But you've got a bit of knowledge on that. Yeah, so because um, for the vets race, they don't have stake boats. Um, A number of years ago, and I can't remember exactly when, um, there was kind of a a debate over who won by a foot. And so they essentially said, uh, we're basically, we can't give margins of a foot. We need to have at least six foot. Uh, So the Oxford women were claiming at Imperial uh, during the kind of alumni watching party that they had been Cambridge by a foot. That, I have not seen photo evidence of that, so I'm sure maybe Cambridge are debating whether uh, they won by a foot. But essentially, unless it's six foot, it's a dead heat because they didn't quite have the kind of the uh, photo finish capacity. Same rules at Henley. If you win by less than a foot, you re-row. Well, slightly different, but yeah, mm. you can't win by less than a foot. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, smidge isn't like a... Didn't they have a the narrowest of margins as a one of the margins for uh, Henley last year? Oh, uh, it was so between less than Great two, knowledge. but more than one. Yeah, was submarged. That's a yeah. good one. Mm, crazy. Uh, yeah, that's good. Again, like good to see the vets thing going on. Um, and I yeah, saw... one of the two races that Oxford won the men's vets, three quarters of a length. I think it was a really solid race. Um, I mean, to win by less than a length, I think they were changing blows the whole way down and. I think the men's bets race is a lot more established than the women's and the women's is certainly picking up speed, which is really exciting. But I know that the guys both in the Crabtree 8 and the Oxford Alumni 8 uh, were probably out training for a surprising amount of time. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I saw. I used to row with Fred Gale, who I saw was stroking uh, in Crabtree, which is quite nice to see him go. Yeah, Um, the competitive enough runs deep. Like no matter how many years beyond, you still, uh, yeah, you still want to (laughs) win. I think I said it with Sarah Winkless uh, last week, but I had... um, a uh, school coach of mine was Oxford and one of the kids a bit above me ended up going to Cambridge and getting in the Cambridge blue boat. So like one of the kids, he sort of taught how to row and he was like, I can't do it. I can't support Cambridge. I, I was like, what? It's been a really <laughs> tricky. So obviously I'm part of Wox, uh, yeah. which is like the winning Cox, where we're trying to kind of get a bit more of a community of Coxes going. And oh, there was a lot of conflict going on because we really want to support Tilda, uh, Tilda Horn, who's obviously coaching um blondie um but then you know me and zoe were like we just can't do it for cambridge <laughs> and so uh yeah yeah it, it it runs deep but you know we're all friends really yeah it's kind of similar for us because we also like both 
work with uh, both Oxford and Cambridge. So mm. it's, uh, we're just hoping for a good race and for a competitive event and just to, like see all athletes give it their all. Yeah. I definitely enjoyed like chatting to both coaches and like uh, interacting with like, both camps, seeing what's happening. Yeah, it's quite fun. We always so because they use Thames Rowing Club, Thames are always away the week after Ace Head. So we always go and fix their eggs. Mm. So we were around on the embankment for the first few days, just like getting to chat to everyone and see what's going down. Nice. Uh, cool. Okay, so let's get into. We'll start with with the reserves, and we'll go to the four full. So, um, if we go for reserve women's race first, uh, so this is another one that Oxford won. Uh, got the verdict at five lengths. Um, did you see any of that? Any thoughts on it? Um, I've watched it back. Um, there was some footage filmed by the BBC, um, which is fantastic because it means we can actually see mm. pretty much the whole race. Um, there's cameras on the launch and also cameras on the bank, so. There's some really good footage of that and seeing Osiris celebrate across the line. Uh, Catherine King was at two in the Osiris boat and she's rode for Cambridge for a number of years and heroically made it back after a back operation, a year long amount of rehab. Um, so although it was an Osiris victory, I think it was a kind of proud feeling to see Catherine make it in that side of things. Um, watching the race back, I think both crews looked really well drilled um, and I really hope Blondie were really proud of the performance they put in uh it looked to me at essentially like they were just up against a faster crew and that was a cyrus yeah and i mean I, I was actually doing the talk at the british dinner uh for oxford um and you know one of my kind of main things was talking kind of talking about a bit of like tenacity and and i think the boat race breeds that because it is a really long side by side race with one other person and um you know the what the training requires but i mean Osiris I just have to like give them so much credit because they did not have the week of dreams so I mean they had a a bus crash on the Tuesday Uh, I saw you guys that's when I was on Putney and I was like we were trying to chat and sort this out and I was like I gotta go (laughs) it was all a bit stressful they 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 had an incident with the bus everyone was was okay two of them had to go and get checked out um at hospital um and you know, they obviously missed a whole day of training and then they were taking it really easy on the Wednesday as well. And it, in terms of kind of like mental resilience as well, to be able to, okay, be like, okay, we're okay. We can physically do this. But then thinking like, this is not the prep we wanted. Um, and then to kind of pull themselves together and then go and deliver that was amazing. Um, I've been doing some work with Tara as well. I just want to shout out to Tara, the Cox, mm-hmm. um, who she was actually in the boat race, uh, did the blue boat last year and then was doing Osiris this year and sort of obviously managing that's quite tough as a cox selection is quite brutal. And she was beaten by um, Joe, who had done the boat race the year before. So, you know, there was a lot of high caliber in the women's squad with the coxes. Um, and we were doing some work on, you know, how do we get the best out of the crew? And I chatted to her on Wednesday night and she was like, so we didn't plan for this. I was like, no, we didn't. But we can work through it. And I was so, so pleased for her as well. Um yeah, and she was also laughing because she was saying that she really hoped she'd get, I can't remember what it was, Middlesex or Surrey, whichever they ended up on, because she was like, I can't look the other way. Middlesex. Yeah, yeah she was like, <laughs> because I can't actually look to the right because she had something about my whiplash. So yeah, it was it was really good. And, and they trained, yeah, they, it, was, it was just really good. And obviously, you know, I would have loved to see more Oxford, Oxford wins, but I actually think kind of at the dinner, particularly on the women's side, everyone was so proud of Osiris and, and what, what they had done. And I think it's really indicative of some really good stuff that's happening at the club. Um, and everyone was really pleased for James as well, their, their coach, who's kind of been there through quite a lot of turbulence and change and that, that he's got a win under his belt as well. Yeah, yeah, massive respect. I think the only other thing I'll highlight in the race for people who want to watch it back is um, the steering from James Trotman, actually, mm-hmm. um, in the second half of the race kind of mirrors what Ed Bracey did in the Cambridge men's blue boat. So um, they were down um, and uh, James made the decision to cut the corner, um, basically the full final uh, Barnes bridge bend. Um, and I do think that probably um, limited the margin yeah. uh, a touch. Um, and it was a really bold choice, I think. Um, but given that the stream has been so weak, uh, I'm sure there were lots of conversations about that and the steering lines taken, which... Yeah we're going to get into with some of the other races as well yeah i think um it's obviously good to see for, for the women you know disappointing for the for the for the boat race but with their reserve eight and the reserves of four both winning obviously still alan very new um there's a lot of other stuff there's a lot of good stuff to look at i think the thing for me looking at it was 
it sort of felt like potentially like that was the tactic Oxford were looking for because they went fast off the start. They had the guns to get ahead. If you can cut in front before you before your opposition gets that big eight minute advantage, you know, then pretty much the race is over. Mm. Obviously, if if the the women's blue boat race, if they'd managed to do the same thing, they probably would have had the same result. Mm. But for me, again, I again we'll talk about it, but it it's a risky tactic, isn't it? To be like, we're going to definitely be faster than the crew that's doing everything to not let us be faster in the first five minutes of the race. I actually just think, I mean, the boat race is so weird. It's such a weird race. Mm. Um, like, because fundamentally, like, you know, we're talking about those percentages. They aren't big percentages in the grand scheme of things, mm. but it's done over such a long period of time. And then you have this opportunity to take an advantage away from someone else in a way that you don't have in any other racing that I can particularly think of that's just kind of mainstream rowing. I mean, like we always joke, Tom Dyson, who is now the um, para um, uh, PD, but he used to be our chief coach. We used to joke about like, how do we mix up the format? And we were like, oh, maybe we do a 2K, but every last person to the 500 gets eliminated. So like who goes fast, you know, and all these sorts of things. But that is actually like sort of the boat race. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Um, And how do you... Oh, it's so hard. And like, and you're trying to make strategies. And I was doing race plans with the Coxes beforehand. And it's like, you're, you're planning for a chess match and you're turning up and it's a boxing match. Mm. You're like, you can do the best made plans in the world. But then if someone goes, well, I'm going to do this, then we didn't know. Like, I know the the women, there was a lot of conversation before about whether Cambridge were going to cut the bend if they took Middlesex to start with, mm. which is, I believe, one of the reasons that the women's blue boat, when they won the coin toss, actually chose Middlesex to try and manage wow. manage that is that. really that is chess yeah so it is it's, it's you know your, your brain's thinking of all that and you're also just trying to row really well <laughs> yeah in your opinion erin if you had the choice and you were coxing a boat and you won the toss what would you choose i think i'd go surrey um because the middle sex adva- like i think the middle sex advantage is there that little bit at the beginning but you've got to get off really well as well off the start and like I can't remember how many boat races ago it was when that poor girl caught a crab off the start in Oxford and it was like heartbreaking. 2017, that was me. Yeah, and it wasn't you catching the crab. (laughs) Caveat caveat for anyone who didn't know, no. But it was just heartbreaking and like the start is a whole different beast. You talk about it really well actually on on the uh, BBC coverage, just kind of explaining that kind of reversed feather and kind of how you basically get off the start suit. You've got to back yourself to get off the start, get off clean and make the most of that advantage before the Surrey bend kicks in. And I think I think I'd rather have Surrey. What would you choose? Surrey. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a safer option. Um yeah. I think there's sometimes benefits to Middlesex. And to be honest, with the boat race mindset, it's a fifty fifty shot as to whether you get the one you want. Mm. So you never really want to favour one over the other. Um but I think We're going to talk about the women's blue boat in a bit, but I think they might have tactically chosen the wrong station, even though Mm. they were worried about cutting the corner from Cambridge. I do wonder if that race would look, would have looked different if they were on Surrey. Reminds me of like a beginner's point of view. It looked like Oxford women team just on all sides. There's the spare four, the uh, Osiris, obviously in the blue boat. They all came out with a massive amount of energy. So possibly they chose Middlesex for that early advantage just so they could. S- squeeze all the bits of juice out of it and just try and get in front of Cambridge. Like they both went out steaming, like Osiris mm. and the and the women's blue boat. It was mm. great to see, but obviously it's a twenty minute race, yeah. especially on a day of such slow conditions. It, it reminds me a little bit, like kind of the, 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 which size you pick. It's a little bit like Henley, you know, like Barks and Bucks. Like, mm. uh, yeah, it's fifty fifty, but you'd probably rather have Marks, wouldn't yeah, you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah, like like what you were saying. <laughs> Like what kind of what you're saying if you applied it to Henley. So like if if you say if you're on the if you're in the shadow of the island and then you get away first and then you got to cross over because yeah. you got there first. Yeah. You know? Or if you were out in the bank and then you came up to the finish in a high stream and if you got there mm-hmm. first you could cross over. Like that changes changes the dynamic yeah. in a big way. Yeah, yeah. Henley, if you're listening, you know, we'll be interested <laughs> in trying. <laughs> <laughs> uh so okay, so next one was reserve men's race. Uh, so Goldie Isis. Goldie won this one. Uh, verdict four lengths at the end. Um, this was kind of, again, only saw it briefly, but pretty convincing pull away from from Goldie, sort of outgunned. Mm. Two really good looking crews, I yeah. thought. Um, I think they both looked really well drilled. Um, I would 
it might, might be controversial, but I think Goldie might have looked the most flair out of any of the crews. And I don't know if it was partly because they were in gold, but I thought their rhythm <laughs> looked absolutely fantastic. Um, super sharp around the front and, and then just so much time around the back end. Mm. Um, it just looks fantastic. But um, yeah, it was just a matter, I think, of um, they were quite close together for a reasonable amount of mm. time, actually, given that Goldie um, had the Surrey bend. But yeah, it kind of panned out like a typical... Uh, Goldie Isis and Goldie has the Surrey bend and at some point on the Surrey bend they got out and in front mm-hmm. and I think I saw down, it, and that was just it. by Hammersmith they pretty much had a length yeah they weren't quite through but they you know that was going to be convincing um do you think they were sharp on the rhythm because uh, Goldie was mostly made of guys who've been in that system under Rob Baker for quite quite a number of years or was it quite a fresh crew there are quite a few people with experience of the system for sure um I don't quite know how many but certainly I can think of at least three names that were in Goldie last year. Um, And Goldie Isis race last year was the closest Mm. race. Like they were side by side with Goldie holding around the entirety of the Surrey Bend on the outside. Incredible race. Um, So I think they probably had really good foundations um, from that side of things. But Isis had blues in it, you know, and actually so did Goldie um, had one blue and Isis also had Isis returners too. So they, they were both pretty stacked reserve crews, actually babies as well they're so young I thought I was just showing my own age but I remember like, like I was looking through the Break Race program and I was like oh my gosh I'm 19 <laughs> um, so I think like I, I actually really agree I actually think both boats are rowing really pretty well um, I just think I think yeah basically kind of Goldie outclassed um, um, Isis on on, the, on this one but I do actually think it, again it's quite promising I, I'm kind of quite a few of them are undergrads so it's kind of good from that that kind of like development perspective as well mm. and uh same as the reserve women's race the isis cox i can't remember his name hamish hamish cut the barns bend at the end mm. as well uh to minimize that distance they had to travel yeah i know that there was some kind of trying assessments going out in the week previously um you know trying to mimic the tides and things like that and then kind of seeing where the stream was yeah. because it's been really interesting kind of conversation that's been ongoing because, I mean, we all know it's, it's so much rain. I mean, I walked here across the bridge, absolute torrential rain. And, you know, we saw ridiculous speeds going down in men's head the week before. And, 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 you know, all credit to the Ander setting a course record, but you know, that, that wasn't a boat full of Olympians. <laughs> like that was like a, a boat full of very good club rowers. So, it just shows how fast, how much water there is, how fast it's moving. I saw some very amusing scenes of people who got caught out by um, the flood tide uh, in uh, Putney, having to roll up their smart chinos and wade out and try and get home. Um, but like, there's so much water. So I do think it's been really interesting, this kind of conversation about where the best water is. Yeah. And that's reflected in the times, right? Mm. Um the the women's blue boat did 21 minutes yeah, and yeah. the record is 18.23. Yeah. You know, the full three to four minutes off the records, which is slow. If, yeah. you, if you were to add that distance or oh, that time on the ergo, uh, if you were doing like a max 5k piece, I'd die. <laughs> You'd be absolutely <laughs> livid, <laughs> wouldn't you? <laughs> but I feel like that's like, that was my initial thought when I watched, obviously on the live coverage, the women's first race go off. Like Oxford looked like they're absolutely sending it. But Cambridge just looks so smooth. Mm. I was like, we know this is going to be one of the longest races, you know. Or that, like straight away, I was like, oh. See, see, I did. I actually, I mean, I've spent some time with the Oxford crew, so I'm probably a little bit biased. But like, they, I, I don't believe, unless you know, the briefing changed that that was necessarily their intention. Like when I saw them doing some starts in the week, it was quite like you know, focus on, on cleanliness and, and being really sharp and, and their starts really, really come on. I think, um, and I, and I also think that, I don't know, there's, I might be wrong. There's an element of like, you're going into a race and you know, you're the favorites. And mm. I mean, that's touch wood. We're both in probably quite a good position that we are in good places. You know, you, you we've beaten this whole cycle. Like, you know, we're <laughs> neither have I, like we're in a good place. Like, and that, like the way that I see a start, is often is not we we don't win the race no you don't get any medals to be the first of the 250 or the 500 it's about your base pace being the fastest so yeah whether you know adrenaline took hold and whether they're actually really just flipping good at starts maybe I, I, I don't know um but yeah it was it was it was an interesting one but uh I think it was a race of two halves obviously for the Oxford women in terms of 
if you looked at the how they were rowing before kind of the incident and afterwards, it, it was like two different crews. Yeah, I mean, in the first two minutes of that race, you, you could just see the six years worth of anger in the Oxford crew just being like laid out onto the water. It's just, even like from what they were posting on social media in the days prior to the race, they just wanted to get out there and just get it done. I would too, you know? Yeah. Like, what, what are you going to do? You're not going to wait. Like, this is it. One day, one chance to get a ride. I'm on it. Yeah. So, yeah, women's blue boat race. Margin ended up being seven, seven lengths. Yeah, yeah. Which I really walking. don't think is reflective of the race when you watch it pan yeah. out, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's the one where the margin really doesn't reflect just yeah. how incredibly exciting yeah. that race was. That's good. Yeah, so we'll get there. We'll get there. But uh, just briefly, the lightweight uh, races ah. first. Obviously, we can't forget this. Um, so lightweight women and lightweight men. So both won by Cambridge, both by five lengths. Men five and a half, women five lengths. And again, looking back, it sort of looked like both crews by Fulham had made their mark. They were sort of coming out to a length out by Fulham. Just have a look at them. I did. Um, that is the case for the men's race. Um, and the Cambridge men's lightweight boat had six blues from last year. Okay. Right. Um, and one from their spare pair from last year. So it was an incredibly experienced crew. Uh, I know that the Oxford lightweight men's boat had, I think, a Paul's stern pair, um, who are fairly new to the program. So there's definitely some momentum there. But yeah, the, the Cambridge men's lightweight race was just, I think Oxford were outgunned. Hmm. Yeah, hugely. And, uh, again it's it's not excuses um but it is an interesting one um i think i hope that you know over like kind of the coming years as you now got the lightweights amalgamated into that program because previously it was separate until this year there's potentially going to be a bit of stumble, stumbling blocks in the way that they're kind of navigating it and i think um it's not always you know we, we talk about lightweight rowing and we think about lightweight rowing and we're thinking about you know the image of grants and emily craze and stuff and and it, some of some of the people there are lightweights as in lightweights in the way you guys are lightweights some of them are just kind of slightly smaller rowers <laughs> um who end up being eligible for lightweight mm -hmm. and so it's it's interesting and i think actually um the way that the programs are hopefully developing and i think definitely for oxford's case it will benefit from being part of that bigger program um absolutely i mean coming from a smaller program like we as a power rowing team massively benefit from training with these guys in the same place mm -hmm. like because you you have more momentum you have more bodies you have more drive you have upward pressure all those sorts of things so yeah i think they were absolutely kind of outgunned on the day but i think yeah hopefully that kind of moving towards oubc as one united club is, is a really good thing yeah definitely and i i, I always love the lightweight races because not only i think they're so special because there are so many fewer of them in the racing calendar but I think for both Oxford and Cambridge, they are such a true reflection of college rowers mm -hmm. yeah. in such a higher percentage than the open weight boats. I would say the lightweight boats are filled with people that learned to row at college and are just seeing what they can do. And I think that's so cool, you know, for people that are learned to row two, three years before making the step up to do something on the big stage. Well, the same with basically Imogen and I both, we both start at college level and, mm -hmm. and, you know, like I think, it, it just shows kind of the, the caliber of the programs and what the programs can do, um, which kind of what makes the boat race really special because you do have people like us who basically came up and through and then you have people, you know, internationals coming in and yeah, it, it is a kind of a random melee of people that were working towards one thing and I think that's what makes it really cool. Yeah, having a squad of people like with the same aim is, is awesome. So like you said, with both clubs now combined, lightweights working with heavyweights a bit more, seeing lightweights in heavyweight boats um i think that can only be good for both sides um but yeah i think that if you knew you had that kind of power that sort of shows where the middle sex wins because you can put the race to bed early mm. but who knows yeah. if you've got it you only know on the day yeah yeah yeah, it's, yeah it's fantastic for athletes to have the platform to you know start rowing at college and actually like see that there is a clear progression to actually be, like being able to train in the blue squad. I know Cambridge is great for that because uh, you you are on the same stretch of the river. So like it's only a short walk to the Goldie Boathouse versus not. So you do kind of like train in a completely different place. Mm. But yeah, I think yeah one thing that we saw is that Cambridge's development is fantastic in the way that they they have athletes in their system for quite a few years and they can progress like, like you said from being in a spare race to then in the lightweights or if if they can to then like racing in the blues. 
that's that's a fantastic advert for the sport and then also hopefully not that many people are going to be disencouraged because of the fact that they you know recruitment can be sometimes too polarizing from abroad etc like it's good that they feel like they have a chance yeah totally i think as well like a lot of i think it's sort of taken for granted a little bit even now um having combined clubs and we talked to sarah winkless last week who said in like 97 that women weren't allowed in the goldie boathouse Mm -hmm. like let alone allowed to train there um abysmal i know that's a while ago now but like i still think that's pretty cool to get somewhere where I mean, all these races are in the same place. They're all given the same, you know. Okay, they don't have a, the, the coverage on the BBC, but they're all filmed. You can see that stuff on YouTube quite quickly. We're here talking about all of them rather than just two. So I think that's cool. Yeah, and I think it's one of the things I think might be quite exciting about um, OUBC being combined as well. Over the last few years, there's a huge number actually of uh, lightweight blues who have made the transition into open weight boats. Um, the stern pair of Blondie were both lightweights. Um, Rosa Millard last year in the women's blue boat, Matt Edge this year in the men's blue boat. I, I, the list would go on. I think there were two other lightweight, ex lightweights in Goldie. There's so many, and that's facilitated because we were a combined club. Mm-hmm. And I know that it was very difficult at Oxford up until recently to move between them. And there was sometimes animosity, I would say. Yeah. But that's not going to be the case anymore. And I think that's just going to raise the standards. Yeah, totally. And I just think. Yeah, it's it's been a little while coming. Like you know, I, I do think I I do think that you know we're talking about like it's, it's been a bit Cambridge heavy recently uh, on the old wins, and we're not talking about last couple of years. You know, and it's quite a few years now, and and I do think there is an element of 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 not being a combined club and like not having that sharing the resources and stuff. Like it, it's ten years since my boat race. It was ten years actually on Saturday, and oh, um, and I went to the boathouse. Um, it was probably like the first time I've been back since I've been ill because um, I went down kind of after around COVID time. But I didn't go inside because, you know, pandemic. And I remember like, and I went in and even within like the boathouse itself, you've got, um, you know, multiple kind of big rooms upstairs, like crew room vibes. And um, there was, we went in and I did a little chat with them and we went out on some launches and stuff. And I went in and I was like, I've never been in this room because this was the men's like crew room. Yeah. And, you know, and, and it's mad. Like, you know, and, and you're like, that is insane but that was just what was and 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 things are moving and and I think it's happening more and more across university sport as well which is really good like I I went to Vinnie's which is um kind of like the blues club in in London had a lovely chat with a really nice guy who's the bursar and he's like oh you're a member here and I'm like no you no because when I was here women weren't allowed in (laughs) and you know like that's 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 equal and there's an element of oh you know we can bang a drum be like well it should have changed earlier and yes it should but it has changed now and we need to be driving that and, and pushing that kind of positivity rather than kind of negativity. Yeah. yeah. And from experience, it is mind blowing how quickly it's normal. Mm-hmm. So I, my first boat race was in 2016, which is the same year that the new Ely Boathouse right. was built. And the first time that the men and women's squads and lightweight men trained out of the same place. Nice. And my degree was quite long I took some time away I came back so I saw the change over the six seven eight years from that point and it is incredible to me how all of the athletes there just take it for granted yeah Yeah. and I I'm like I remember Mm -hmm. I remember when we had a tin shed and the men had showers and we didn't yeah you know and that's just not the case anymore I was literally going to ask you about that because you've seen that transition to to a single club roughly how long do you think it it took for those changes to adapt so now obviously Cambridge is dominating uh, that's probably taken some time after like switching to a single club yeah I think to be honest it was galvanized pretty quickly the pressure was mounting um, and it was very strong um, I think to some extent it helped in that uh, Rob Baker had coached the women for a number of years and moved to the men and so I think a lot of the ideas running through the building had a very similar thread um, and we've had remarkable continuity across all of the clubs now combined um, in terms of coaching staff so it was that kind of thing I think in some ways it was more a matter of um, getting it through the various steering committees with the the older alumni um, especially on CBC's side um, but once it happened 
it was just so obvious that it was the right answer. And I don't think we've ever looked back. I think it's just like, from the point of the smaller things, admin, I mean, I've coached at a college in Oxford. Uh, when I turned up, it was the same thing. There was a separate, it was like they were running two boat clubs out of one boat club. And you've got things as stupid as just um, men stealing batteries out of the women's lights to put their lights on the boat so they can go out and just like rudders and not even having shared parts boxes, all these things that seem like such small bits and pieces. But like when you're in, you know, you were trying to fight that those people over there and we're just like battling each other on the inside. So just the day-to-day stuff, I think, can make a big difference. Yeah. Cool. Let's get on to what probably was the most com- oh, uh, controversial. Can I talk a bit about the lightweight women's oh, briefly? Oh, sorry. Oh, please yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. didn't quite touch on that one because yeah, um, I think the margin at the end didn't actually reflect what happened in okay. the race. Yeah. Um, talk us through it. So exciting. So uh, the Cambridge lightweight boat had a fair number of returners. So did the OEW. Mm-hmm. Um, l- sorry. Oxford lightweight women. I, I keep doing it too. I, I did it. I, that's, my, that's on me. Um, so Cambridge pulled out to clear water before Hammersmith, I would say. Um, but what I noted was that I think their Cox was taking quite a wide line from Harrods through to the start of Chiswick Steps, like that kind of area. They were on Middlesex and they were very wide around that bend, even though they had clear water up and it opened the door and Oxford pulled back and pulled back and pulled back and they got to half a length from being clear water down it was um, 0.6 at the Chiswick Steps yeah. marker yeah at and the steps was, yeah so good so that's sort of halfway yeah uh, yeah. yeah beyond past just, halfway yeah, past past halfway. Halfway. yeah. yeah. Uh, and it looked like it was going to shape up to be just a very exciting race and I don't know how that will have felt in the Cambridge Lightweight women's boat because watching your opposition get closer and closer and closer um, but once it got to that margin, it looked like they rallied. I think they probably got into a bit of a better line as it came back to their bend in the final corner. Uh, and then they were able to pull away to five lengths. But again, the margin really doesn't reflect how exciting of a race it was. Yeah, it was, it was a really, really good race. And it was interesting because I saw that crew, um, uh, a month ish ago. Um, and they'd, oh, they'd been lent this gorgeous boat from Embarker. And I was like, you don't know how nice this boat is. Look after this boat. <laughs> and it was, it was a beautiful boat, but like it was slightly too big for them. But, you know, beggars can't be choosers. Thank you very much for the boat. Um, and when I saw them a month this ago, they looked a bit too small for the boat. Like it just looked like it was, it was, it was a tiny bit too heavy for them. And then when I saw them again in boat race week, I was like, guys, like you look so good. Like so long, like long in the volume, really long around the pin and stuff. And, um, yeah again i don't think the margin sort of reflected it but like the kind of grit of that for them to come back um and i spoke to their cox ellie before and she was kind of they, they'd had a couple of interesting fixtures in part of the fixture calendar but well what we said you know that there's not that many opportunities there's not it's quite hard actually to get them for for the lightweight eights to get a, an appropriate fixtures is that if that makes sense yeah, i kind absolutely. of pitching the right boats which is going to challenge them or you know and, and stuff so they the few kind of fixtures they had they've just kind of like been up and gone and and they and so they i chatted to ellie in the week saying she was like how do i work the crew if we're down and and stuff and so like full credit to the crew on her because that was actually quite an untested situation that they had to come back through obviously the result didn't go their way in the end but like i think they can come off kind of super proud with how they did because that was a really kind of new situation for them and, and and it's a it's a long old race for a lightweight as well <laughs> yeah 23 minutes for the winning crew for the lightweights because they had a headwind yeah. as well That's as right, no stream yeah. but i it was really touching for me actually um i did the prize giving last year um and i had some really lovely conversations with some of the oxford lightweight women last year and they you know they'd said to me yeah we just we don't know what we can do better. We thought we had a better season than last year. We trained harder. We got stronger. We did, you know, as much as possible and it just didn't seem to change the results. And I think that was, that, you know, that got me here because that's really sad. But I know this year they were really proud of what they did um, and the grit, the tenacity. And I know they didn't win that race, but I actually think all of that crew are really pleased with how that turned out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can't, uh, ultimately, like, you can't affect how fast the opposition is. So <laughs> you can really do is look back and how much can you take from it? How happy with were, did you do the race plan you wanted to? And yeah, to crawl back, like, you see on the statistics, almost no one does it. You know, 
even having done this all year and even this race meaning everything to you once you're a couple of links down i mean i only one i did i did a few match fixtures but i remember the first one i did as a part of an under 23 team we did it against cambridge and we went we went like down at harrods and the thing we we're racing to the steps and I just sat there for like five minutes. So I was like, I am never doing the boat race. <laughs> like this is the most, I never really experienced really being in wash like that when they came in front of us. Mm-hmm. And just like, there's nothing I could, there's no, how could I, how can we possibly get mm-hmm. back in this race? Because you're just washing out. And it was just like, in my mind, I was like, I'm never doing Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah. I was just going to ask, obviously with all athletes being the same size in the lightweights race, what do you think made a difference? in the final verdict like what? I mean that's always the case with lightweight row and that's why it's always quite t- quite tight yeah. yeah I was just specifically like asking from a lightweight's point of view and someone who's done this race I think uh, for lightweight racing you can't count on having more power you can't count on having more body weight mm. so the way that I always see it is using it in the best way possible um, and it looked to me like especially it was slow conditions it was a headwind and it looked to me like Cambridge had just more length under the water their blades were just buried for longer and so they were able to just not try and hurry it through not try and bully it and tire themselves out but just like hang the body weight that they have all the way through to the finish um and I think Oxford were doing a decent job at actually keeping it looking lively uh, but I don't think they had the quite the same uh length under the water that makes total sense. Yeah, I'd agree. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we will. I just so we briefly mentioned earlier in terms of favour and stuff. I thought worth asking before we before we talk about the the sort of first first eights. Um, do you why do you think Oxford was favourite in both the men's and the women's? I think it's so arbitrary this concept of favourites. Yeah. Um, I think I think sometimes you can look at personnel i think it's and you go okay (laughs) like these are some you know you've got some big dogs who are there's either you know the 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 really experienced boat race veterans who have you know i think there's 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 an element of you know what it takes to win um you've got obviously the kind of potentially kind of olympic uh drop-ins and on 23s and things like that um uh but i it's really hard because i think like you know, the bookies get behind it and all this sort of thing. And so that always skews the odds. I mean, I'm, I really like horse racing and, you know, you can have a horse that ends up being back to the favorite and the back to the favorite. And then all the bookies go, oh no. And then they like mm. flip the odds because they don't want to lose all their money and <laughs> like stuff like this. So I think, yeah, I, 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 I do think it adds a lot of pressure as well. Um, and then that, that expectation. And um, I think, people either thrive or, or then they rise to the challenge. They're like, we're the underdogs and look what we can do. And I don't know. I think it's, I think it's quite an interesting one. And it's talked about so much in the boat race, far more than it is in any other kind of mm-hmm. rowing context. You don't often yeah. hear like Crossy going, oh, these are the favorites. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, I think it comes down to two different things. Um, I think one of the easiest ways to look at whose favorites is seat by seat. Okay, who who do we think is the better athlete in the bow seat, in the two seat, mm-hmm. in the three seat? Um, and I'd say Oxford probably won on that because they had Lucy Edmonds and Annie Sharp in the blue boat, both of whom were two really good recruits. Um, and similarly in their men's blue boats, they had Lenny Jenkins and Harry Glenister. Mm-hmm. And they're names that people in the rowing world would recognize outside of the boat race. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think, neither of the Cambridge crews had names like that, despite the fact they actually had probably more boat race experience overall. I think the second part of it is the fixtures, yeah. uh, which I always say, I think people read too much into fixture results, to be honest. Um, but broadly speaking, it was pretty solidly agreed that for sure the Oxford women had definitely done better in their fixtures than the Cambridge women. Mm-hmm. The Cambridge women had lost every single set mm-hmm. um, and the Oxford men had a smaller advantage but in general had done better in their fixtures than the Cambridge guys yeah yeah that's kind of what we talked about I think it must have come from the fixtures but again when when you've got a bit of a bit if you know a bit more about the fixtures again for example I did a few with Leander you know it doesn't matter how many times we're getting told can you please do that you know because we were like no like I want the opportunity to smash the blue boat Mm -hmm. Uh, and so whoever you're racing is not going to stick to your plan they're not really necessarily trying to help you sometimes that's a good thing you can have a dog fight 
Mm. But other times you can kind of, you know, it doesn't really help a lot to like jump them off the start and not have a race. Um, so I think certain things like that, obviously, as much as the bookies will look at fixture results, are they looking at who's in their boats? Like, there How was much some, they know about rowing? Very, <laughs> absolutely. Well, that as well. Like, I think in the women's, like, like the women's Leander crews, they, they raced twice, but they were very different. Yeah. Exactly. And said, yeah, like the crew lineups. Were and there was different. a lot of comparisons for the women being drawn in the Oxford UL fixture versus the right. results of UL and Cambridge at, women's head okay but there were three people different between those two crews and that's big enough and also i think um one thing that is underestimated with the fixture calendar as well is the boat race season is only seven months long and some of the fixtures happen six weeks apart from each other with Mm -hmm. the same crews that's a huge percentage of your season to be gaining speed or or changing things and those results then get directly compared that's such a solid point Yeah. yeah i mean we've talked a lot before about um Everyone starts as an underdog, so I think everyone gets really good to being able to use that as a as a like a little a little powerful thing, you know. Like we're not supposed to win, so we can. And I think a lot of people struggle when they first don't become the underdog. And like you said, there's a lot of pressure of like oh, we're not like we're not just the chances. We're not having a go. We've not got nothing to lose if we don't make it. Uh, I wonder whether that like played a little bit into Oxford. Yeah, potentially. A note to all coaches out there: don't ever brief a crew saying you've got nothing to lose. I've had it from all the way up through my career and I really hate it it really sends my head right before I push off because I'm like yes I do (laughs) um and uh yeah but I I do think I don't know I think it's hard like I can speak from experience in my own boat race um Christine Wilson who was my coach was uh, we were starting to get talked about as the favorites going into our race and she was like that is that do not like that was like the rudest swear word you could possibly say kind of around what we were doing and and all of that sort of thing she was just like no one else impacts your race you don't you know it's all the mindset stuff and it might be and like I think you know if we're gonna talk about the women's race first like you know there's that element of of you never know what's going on in people's heads but as Oxford were getting kind of rode down you know there's an element of that narrative of like this shouldn't be happening like why is this happening which then boosts Cambridge going like this shouldn't be happening either. Woohoo! <laughs> Look, we're, we're moving. And, and I think, yeah, I mean, rowing is, is a huge mindset game. Like it's, it's, it's all about, especially in the boat race. Oh, yeah. Huge. And so, like, yeah, you just, you just never know what's getting in people's heads. Yeah. Complacent. We've all like had that complacency. We all talk, spoke about it and we all said we weren't going to do this. And every, you know, talk about every race, every GB trials, every eight said someone's going to not go off with the fire. You know, like that complacency is like that silent kind of under, under there. It can come and sneak up at you. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about it then. So the, the women's Gemini boat race, like you said, 21 minutes, a long race. I think we all knew it was going to be a long race. Imogen said seven lengths. So I literally was about to say you're a walking encyclopedia of rowing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did spend two and a half hours commentating on, on it yeah. on Saturday. Yeah. yeah. Um, and watching that race mostly crouched in front of the screen like this, oh, me watching too. the entire thing. So um, stressful. Oh my goodness. I, it's going to be one that goes down in the ages. Oh. I think. Me watching that is probably um, the reason why I wasn't commentating on it because I was like, uh, 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 I can talk, I might have sworn. Like, I was like, yeah, this is why the BBC don't let me anywhere near it. <laughs> yeah, talk to us about the coxing. Yeah. So I just want to like step back and this is this applies to kind of all of, um, yeah, basically all of the boat races. I don't think the, the coxers get enough credit for how hard it is to cox a boat race um so for me as a you know international six lane boring racing in comparison even just getting on the start line is for me kind of 60 70 percent of actually my job on the day like making sure we're warmed up well making sure we're in a good place getting on the start line like getting on those state boats is actually really hard there's an element of like pressure how embarrassing would it be if you miss the stake boats and like you know it's happened before like you've got to get on the stake boats and you're there and then you 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 have so much pressure and this was I was working with with Tara quite a lot like and helping kind of Alan you know figure out the racing plans and stuff like that because there was a few things where I was like okay and then you know these seconds that's when we do this bit or whatever and I'm like she needs to be looking up she cannot be looking down counting seconds. Like we need, we need eyes up because the stake boats start quite far away from each other and the crews converge quite quickly. Um, and you know, you've got to pick your line. You need to see where you are. You need to see 
you know, let's say they have been on Surrey and, oh, they've gone off to Middlesex. Do I follow? Do I not? You're trying to deliver a race plan. It's nuts. So I, I just think, you know, I'm always really, really careful to kind of comment on the coxing in a way without kind of contextualizing. It's a really hard thing to do. Um, and listening to like coxing recordings of people who are doing boat races, like one of the things you're always trying to do as a cox is find the calm. Like you don't want to be like banging the drum all the time. That's not what makes a good cox. Like you need to be able to talk to them. You need tone, you need pitch. It's really hard to do that when someone's like bah, 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 like this and it's on your side and you're like, they're making a move. Should I make a move? Should I respond? Should I not? It's, it's a big old, it's a, it's yeah, it's a, you know, you end up with a kind of a hangover of mental energy after after a race so um I think yeah I think it's really tough like I think so obviously you know what happened in the, in the women's race was obviously Oxford went off 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 in Middlesex got up um a length never quite got clear smidge smidge of clear maybe but it was on a surge I like, got him so uh, by four minutes or so between three and four but certainly by four minutes um Oxford have got a length. Yeah, they they yeah, haven't basic- broken away, but they, they've got a length. At that point, you're thinking, right, all Oxford need to do now in the next minute is get in front before before the Surrey bend and it's over. Yeah. Um, Cambridge then, as we say amazingly, n- un- to not as to be expected, from seven minutes, yeah, so in, the, in three and a half minutes from seven to 11 and a half minutes in, they go from a length down to a length up. Yeah, it was, it was huge. That yeah. was like that's a huge difference, and like coming from Oxford Strong, and they're going to win this. That's sort of where, from my point of view, it looked like they'd worked so hard so early, because then there was such a change, sort of from from Hammersmith or Harris to Hammersmith, like seemed to be such a change of the tide. Yeah, I think so. Kind of looking at the rowing, like I think I think Oxford looked looked good, looked really good in those first couple of minutes, like really direct getting blades in the water um, and just kind of getting in and on. Um, I think that was really good. Um, and they just never, like, what I would have loved to have seen is, is you know, like they just, which happened in most of the other races is, is you just get up and then you just go. And I think they, it looked maybe like they were kind of playing that slightly longer game being like, well, we're here. So long as we stay here, like when we'll c- carry on with the bend, like who knows whether that was like intent intention or not. But like I I I thought kind of the writing was sort of on the wall. And mm. then Cambridge, like huge credit to Cambridge. Um, and also big credit to Hannah, who um kept them in the race. Um, I actually think up until that point, kind of the steering from both coxes was was very good, like in terms of the way they were managing it, you know, they never quite had the clashing of the men's boat race and stuff like that. And like, it's really hard. I know people want that, but I don't want that. <laughs> like, I think, yeah, okay, it's nice to, you know, you can be close by and all that, but like, you don't want, you don't want a race that's won on anything other, in my opinion, than a crew that's better than the other. Like, you don't want a de facto reason to win or not. Yeah. Um. So I think, I think they did, they did a really good job. Um, where it kind of then gets a bit tricky is obviously when Cambridge Cambridge come up. So in terms of the rules of the boat race, you can have as many warnings as you like okay. in theory. Yep. However, like if there is then contact caused by one crew going into another crew's water, which then impedes the other crew and could change the the result of the race, that's when we start getting kind of contentious disqualifications and things like that. So unlike other races where, um, so for example, in Henley, if you go in front and your wash is considered to have impeded the boat, you can get disqualified, but only in the boat race, only when there's contact. If yeah. it's in your water and you contact the boat in front, would would that yes. potentially get? It, it's difference. called a foul yeah. in the boat race. Um, and I think sometimes it can be really confusing to people watching if they're hearing... Cambridge, 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 or Oxford, 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 and they're like, why, why haven't yeah, they yeah. Be dis- been disqualified yeah. yet? And it's because a foul in the boat race is very, very specific. It's physically contacting another crew. It's causing a crab, probably, um, that directly impacts the outcome of that race. Um, and so that is a much, much narrower decision than any international racing and, and any Henley racing we will have ever seen. 
Um, and yeah, it's one of those intricacies of the boat race. It's kind of surprisingly simple, uh, but also very different. Mm. Um, but yeah. Yeah, totally. And, and so the difficulty came essentially where sort of Hannah was getting warned a lot and it's really hard because if I was so Joe was the Oxford Cox and and he actually was in like a very similar situation in 22 mm-hmm. um where Jasper basically kind of and, uh, uh, so, it, no, it, no? Um, James Trotman was in the blue boat last year Wait. James was in 22 Tara Joe, Cox sorry Joe yeah. was in my race yes yes James, Joe, Joe and Jasper were in yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah um and he basically kind of pulled the cross and um you know, it was it was a bit of a deja vu moment mm-hmm. potentially for Joe, um, and it's really hard because basically Cambridge are being warned a lot. I will also caveat they were warned that- twice. Okay, they were warned <laughs> twice. Oh, oh, sorry, <laughs> Twi- they um, yeah. But yeah, what's yeah. what I will also caveat is that what I don't know and I haven't spoken to Hannah is could she even hear that? Because it's actually really hard mm. to hear when you're getting a warning. Um, there's a lot going on. There's a helicopter, there's launches, there's crowds, etc. But she had two warnings. Um, and Joe, it was basically kind of, what was it? it was her warning and then it was Oxford hold your line. Pretty much. So from, I mean, from what I watched back, um, they're, they're, I think they were both very close to Surrey already. Yes, I agree. In the racing line anyway, which would make it Cambridge water mm-hmm. because Cambridge were on Surrey. Um, I do think Hannah moved in just a smidge mm-hmm. to send the puddles down. And look, the last couple of years, there's been some really aggressive Cambridge coxing yeah. and the umpires have been getting real twitchy about it. Yeah. You know, we Cambridge have got to make sure that doesn't keep happening because there's going to end up being a DQ. And yeah. the umpires know that and the coxers know that and the coaches know that. And so do Oxford. Yeah. So I think when, when Joe saw that happen and saw Cambridge being warned... I genuinely think it was probably a spur of the moment thought of like I would they're in our water. They have a call. We're we're basically overlapped with them. Yeah. If we hit them, we get a DQ, we win. And if maybe if he'd done it more gently, maybe if he'd done it a smidge sooner, probably would have been on the right side of the line. But there's a point in the footage you can see he jams on that rudder and you can see the boat going. Do you actually can you see his hands jam? You can't see his hands, but you can watch the, the, See, the so, so, so I watched, I, go on. Yeah, so I watched the replay a lot, and then listening to the umpire, he says he doesn't put the rudder on. So when you watch a replay, yeah. I tried to see if he did it, and I didn't. But so, but from my point is, and if he calls, like you said, like this has happened a lot. I went back and like last year, it was two feet in the men's and the women's. It was literally two yeah. feet from from game. Mm. So Oxford must have talked about this. It Absolutely. must have worked on this big push, and it has to be a big push because you're in. You're in yep. terrible water. It's bumps right. I feel like if if bow and three sent it, you could make the boat. Turn. So this is my thing. Like I I am going to stick with Joe and say that I don't think he swung for Cambridge because I just think whilst Oxford Cambridge would know and Oxford would know. Like I I don't I I just think that I I he's a sensible guy. I don't think he I don't think he would have done that. However, having spoken from being a Cox, um. You get pull if you're in that sort of thing. You get pulled in. Mm. You get pulled into that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. So then there might have been, you know, he should have been steering against that because you might have been being pulled in. Also, I want to just throw out. Also, we talked about Lucy Edmonds being a really talented athlete. She ended up being moved back to the bow. She was in the seven seat. She ended up being needing to move back from the bow, back to the bow. Sorry, um, because she'd been knocked off her bike on boat race weigh-in day, um, and uh, so she basically needed to come out of the boat for a bit. She wasn't in for that Leander fixture. They ended up having a bit of a reshuffle and then she got put back in the bow because obviously then we could keep that kind of stern unit similar. Um, There's an element as well of if you are close to a clash, one of the reasons clashes end up happening partly is coxing, but also the two sides closer end up backing off just a little bit potentially and you get pulled in because the water's pulling you together. Then they back off. The people on the outside are basically working really hard and then it's it's easier to converge. Um, But ultimately... What I would have loved to have seen happen is for basically kind of... They had... Cambridge had the momentum to just... If they'd have waited like a beat, Mm -hmm. like a beat more and pushed it in, then then it would never have happened and it wouldn't have played out that way. And I'm just, if I'm honest, my main thing is 
I don't really want to get too much into like was Joe right was Joe wrong and all that sort of thing because actually if I if I sit myself in his seat how hard that will have been to have been rode through feeling like you're getting closed down and then having having that kind of play out is is really tough and then that will have been sat rent free in the rest of in all of their heads for the second half of that race um one thing I I probably I think would like to see more from from kind of the boat race and the umpires is is potentially arguably a bit more clarity on at what point should you be pulling forward because it always used to be a length of clear um it's not that point anymore but I don't know I it for me it kind of like it 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 hollowed it a little bit for me in terms of I just wanted it's just really hard. Like I think Cambridge, they were robbed of their opportunity to come across the line. They did celebrate. Mm. Then they had to just sit there and have that. And that's, that's rubbish for them as well. Like, Mm. Yeah, they've just got to wait and then they're like yay but then it's also a bit like Ooh. yeah I had the same thing in 2022 when he also protested after our yeah. race the initial celebration and then you know I could see his hand go up and I went it's going to be fine I know like there was no contact it's fine it's fine it's fine but it's yeah. stressful because it's really you, stressful. You, you're like we've, we've just won but also maybe we haven't but I think also on that no one really wants to win on a DQ no. it would not feel good no. to win on a DQ like there has been one disqualification in the entire history of the race and I think it was an Isis Goldie race and it was because it's 1990 caused like a blade to snap mm. or a rib rigus to snap so they physically impeded the crew that hadn't been warned uh, and so there was a disqualification but other than that point That kind of appeals process has never happened. That kind of bumping the other boat has never happened. And so if that's part of your race plan, I think that's kind of a bit sad, really. Like you want to clean your race. You want to win on your own terms. I would say that we, I don't think it was part of a race plan. Like I I don't think it's fair to say like it was part of their race plan. But what I would also say. I think it was. Well, I don't think so. Um, uh, Also, what I will say is um, Annie Sharp, who was in the boat, it was her dad was in that ISIS crew. Um, and they got DQ'd by the bandstand. Yeah. And um, in their home, they call that the first finish line. Uh, it was the bandstand. <laughs> um, but no, I completely agree. No one wants to win a DQ. And this is where I kind of like Boris Company to kind of like sit and have a little bit think about it. Because there are so many DQs which are not caused by, which are not what they should be in the fixtures. There's at least one DQ a year oh, yeah. and it's from a clash. It's yeah. not from a someone getting in front, blah, 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 you know, and all those sorts of things. And so, and almost I think there's a problem that people know that they don't want to DQ. Like the boat race mm. umpires don't want to DQ. Absolutely. So there's an element of, there's, as you said, there's been some quite aggressive steering. And I'd say it's from, it's come from both sides over the last 10 years um, because they know there's probably not going to be a DQ. You then end up with incidents like there, whatever will happen with Joe when they know there's probably not going to be a DQ. And then you finish and then you have like a six minute, seven minute mm. thing when there's probably not going to be a DQ. Yeah. And so I just think like, oh, wouldn't it just be nicer for everybody if, I mean, it wouldn't be nicer if you just got rode through and then outgunned. But like, I just think like the mental load, it's a little bit like if people are doing trialing, right? And we're doing seat racing. It, it sucks to get seat raced out of a boat. But if you got beaten by someone who was better than you, you can mentally be like, okay. And where I kind of empathize with with the Oxford women um, is that there's there's probably not going to be quite that like mental closure, even though they were being rowed through and they were about to kind of, Cambridge was about to kind of sail off into the sunset. So I think, I don't know. I sort of agree, agree with you both. I, I doubt it was part of the original race plan. To be like, right, we're going to let them get a length up and then we'll bump them. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think again, looking back, like you said, you can see from the calls, it's close. It's really close, obviously, in terms of like where it's the umpire's decision ultimately, where is the middle of the, of the stream? Obviously, it's close. Like you said, they're both being warned, but they can both be warned. But, and I, and I think I agree with you that no one wants to lose but DQ, but I think like Cambridge has been taking the mick a little bit in terms of how early they moved over and in both races last year it was so close I think you can't not think about an Oxford you have to sort of think look if they did that again what what would we do um so I shouldn't it's, imagine that's why they had that a bit plan. of clarity over so the, I 
I, well, you need to... It's, it's the space between you, you should move in front when you're a length up and moving away and a foul is only when the boats touch. Yeah, yeah. that's the space. And, and then and that's what's being exploited. And mm. it's been Cambridge and it's been the last three years. And but it's won them the race. Not, it, well, so I think they would have won anyway. Yeah, this, no, I agree. But no, but what I, I mean, don't I'm think not changed the outcome yeah, of yeah, any yeah. of them. Yeah. But what I think is really yeah. interesting is this is the thing that's being talked about in the last five years. This like really yeah, yeah. aggressive steering, mm. cutting the corners, that sort of thing. Before that, it was always about clashing. And yeah, it's not been so much of a thing in the no. last few years. Well, maybe since since so, the blade got broken, clashing, and everyone yeah, sort of got so reminded. Everyone question, got a bit scared. How is that yeah. gonna? How is how is it going to shift moving forwards? Yeah. Because yeah. I know there have been so many conversations with the Cambridge Coxes. Do not be aggressive. You yeah. should never be aggressive. Mm. This is not what we want. If you do that, we will not select you for the yeah. votes. Yeah. It has been that that clear and that hard. When wow. I come back to saying it won them the race, I, I was meaning actually like I can see why they do it. Like because it because you're like oh, quick because like also, mm. you know, you're about like Cambridge, like they're moving through. They have momentum. I don't know what it you know, like we said, that end result wasn't necessarily reflective. Like they might have put their like, let's put all our eggs in this flipping basket and we need to go now. And they they did and they moved. And then it was like, okay, let's go. <laughs> like, you know, and yeah. then, and, and I, what I would say was um, for Oxford, like I, I think that really messed with their rhythm. Like oh, yeah. in terms of the way they were rowing on the other side of that, um, they oh, they I weren't mean, rowing their best. Had to steer out as well, yeah, yeah. so aggressively. Yeah. Between yeah. between when that came in and came out, they yeah. lost nearly a length within yeah ten seconds. Yeah, but yeah. like power power twenty or whatever it is power thirty to well, win the race. Is. If you then don't, you know, that is yeah, that so yeah. I would why would you try to win the race like that? Because you don't like who wants to win on a DQ. I think. Right? Well, that's, I think that's the thing. I think they found themselves in a position where possibly the Cox didn't use his rudder, but he saw an opportunity. He was like, okay, Cambridge are being worn. They're in our water. 30 seconds, we're going to end the race now because this, this, yeah. well, this is what's in front of him. And then obviously a 20 minute, 20 minute race just came down to like a 30 second window of opportunity and Oxford absolutely spent themselves because they had nothing on that move. Yeah, I, But like if you're in, like what, what you were talking about, Aaron, if you're in this situation and this is in front of you, I mean, you kind of have to go for it, especially knowing that you've just run out, run out of your bend. Cambridge have just like gotten a language of just come from one them. down to one up. Yeah. What's what, left? What are you going to do? Like are you either going to lose or you have a slim chance of winning. So mm -hmm. I think if you have that window in front of you, you have to take it. I can sympathize with like both. Personally, I'd rather win fair and square, mm -hmm. which is like, you know, over 20 minutes, be the faster crew overall. We all win. I'm also going to yeah. take it. But in know? the moment, if someone came down and said, look, you can end this all now. You can have all yeah. the pressure and everything's on you right now. You can finish it. Like, it's difficult not to take that. I was also, that's another thing was when listening to, because I'm um, listening to kind of what they're saying. It was kind of, what was, I can't remember the language or if it was kind of what they were saying to Cambridge. Was it Cambridge move? It was, or no, Cambridge? it was Cambridge. Cambridge. Oxford. Oxford, hold your line. Oxford, I'm warning you. Yeah. Was it? I'm warning you. So I didn't hear it. I was watching it in a very loud room. But I heard the like, hold your line. And originally I was like, like, I, at first I was like, hold your line now. Like where you are, like, like, or whatever, yeah. or move. Like, again, that sort of like, it, it's this is where like it's just that like I think I think you summarize it really well there's that element of like there's like a gap of gray area yeah. of where that is mm -hmm. and I think you know if we can just we don't need to do it doesn't need to be a length of clear even if it's if it's x or it's y and you smidge it down because I think one other thing you know I think the coxes get a hard time I think I'm not saying the umpires should get a hard time but I actually just think let's think about the situation of the umpires here like an eight is quite a long, it's quite a long mm. boat. And they are, I don't actually know how far back they are, but they're a length back-ish. Back, yeah. And so, you know, they're trying to see what's happening as far in ahead as as, as, as they can. Mm. Um, and what's a little bit vague is, is kind of when you get that person pull in front, at what point do they need to move back out? We have seen it in boat races in the last mm. couple of years, but it's, it's, oh, I mean, anyone who's rowed right behind someone else, it's flipping hard to, it it's so hard to be rowing straight behind somebody. And, and like, at what point then does that person, if, if, you know, if we're pulling in with a foot, like, 
if if let's play it out that they moved half a length and then you rode up to a foot, that would be at the point that the umpire would be saying, Maybe. you need to move out the way. So there's that gray area, which I think... Yeah. For the for the benefit of the boat races, <laughs> yeah. maybe just clear the boat up races. a bit. Please. Have a think. Yeah, have a think. Thank you. <laughs> in, the, in the moment, I thought it again, having heard what I'd heard, like, oh, hang on, he's just warned Cambridge Trice and now they bumped. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was really interesting afterwards when he was talking to uh, Joe, and he said, "Joe, we spoke about this before. Yep. Mm. We said you can't follow them back if yep. they've come into your water. You can hit them, but you can't." follow them back and hope to hit them before they cross back over. So the, and that was the point when you're like, absolutely. okay, watch the replay. And you must have thought, like, they must have talked about it. The amount we've yes. talked about it, what happened yeah. last year, they must have talked about it, and they did. This is the thing. If it had happened just two seconds prior, they would have gotten the DQ because the exact mm-hmm. point at where the contact happened was after the after the umpire said, Oxford, hold your line, bump, Oxford, I'm warning it. That's, that's how it happens. So if it happened just two seconds before. Yeah. yeah. I just want to talk a bit about the lead up to to this moment because obviously yeah let's this, let's this moment <laughs> is like the one bit that everyone is going to be talking sure. about within this race um including us <laughs> including including us because yeah sorry guys <laughs> you know it's crazy and there's so much discussion we don't quite yeah. know what the right answer is yeah. but I, I also wanted to just draw the line between new coach at Oxford and kind of the way this first half of the race panned out because mm. Oxford looked super punchy off the start. They had a fantastic start. They drew out to a length real early. Um, and one of the things that occurred to me is that Alan French coached at Brooks mm-hmm. for a long time. And Brooks are like kings of 2K racing. Mm-hmm. They are good at that stuff. And Oxford did really well in their fixtures. And none of the fixtures were the full length of the course. And about 2K into the boat race, about seven, eight minutes, minutes in, Oxford were about a length up. It all it all kind of I was like there might be some learning there of a yeah. first year of a new coach understanding what a 20 minute race looks like versus a seven minute one yeah I, I think that's a good point and actually like a moment just to say like um that I'm so pleased Alan's in post like I've yeah. been doing some work with him over the last month or so and despite us being in very close circles we've never actually really met and when I saw he'd kind of been put in post I actually go to the same church as um, uh, the guy who's the head teacher of Reading Bluecoat. And I went to um, I went to Pete and I was like, Pete, talk to me about Alan. He was like, I'm absolutely livid. And I'm like, oh no. And he was like, I can't believe you've got him. He's the best. And I was like, okay, this is fantastic. <laughs> this is this is what I wanted to hear. Um, and I think I think you're right. Like it's it would be, you know, it, it it's a learning thing. And I think that's one thing that came just had a real advantage of like we'd said with Rob kind of moving kind of over across to the men and then Paddy coming in um and I think I think you know they've got they've got a really good setup going over there and I think that like the Oxford women so obviously I was at the dinner and you know they were really buoyed by a Cyrus win and obviously there was a lot of really disappointed women um and Joe as well but like I think just the culture is is moving in a really really positive way there's a lot of momentum in that club and it's just really nice to be honest as an alumni going back and thinking this is this is really really nice and I also talking about that moment kind of that built up to that that point I also just want to kind of recognize like Cambridge that was insane like that move around the bend like that was so good that I think they did they they held themselves so well and like huge credit to kind of like Hannah and the stern pair especially because when you're down and you're down that far, like you feel like there's a chasm between you guys. And, you know, even when you're rowing through in your three quarters of a length, they're still not got overlap. And so I think, I think, you know, we need to, it is, it is good to have a good old debate about the incident, but actually I do think we should probably, you know, give Cambridge no, yeah, some yeah. real credit. It's, it's incredible. They were think- they, two feet out, like even bow women's probably not really mm-hmm. seeing mm-hmm. any boat here. And like I said, like it was, there was like, two three minutes where like you're you're two feet away from from losing it and yeah. what was said how that was coxed what the effort that was put in was like incredible to watch yeah I think Hannah in her post-race interview what she said she said a little bit about the bump um but I think the the thing that stuck with me was I'm really proud of the whole crew that was the fastest race we could have put down on this day mm. um and it was really that was just really nice to hear you know especially what do you think about when you're down in a boat race and it's a two horse race and only the winners are going to get celebrated? It's about, well, we might be a length down, but I want to do the best race we can today. That's the thing. It looked like the two teams had completely different tactics for that race. If you were to look at both Oxford and Cambridge in isolation, Cambridge just stuck to 
long rowing, their rhythm, their base base, they kind of like really used up those like last six, seven years of that system being so successful. They've followed exactly that profile versus Oxford, like we mentioned, they were just so punchy. If you were to look at them separately, you'd almost think they're rowing for a different course or like a different race of the, the different length of the race. What do you think ma- uh, makes Cambridge's base pace so unshakable? I think it's talked about a lot. Um, and a lot of the preparation is very internal. Often Cambridge, uh, out of Cambridge and Oxford is the one that does the women's head um, when it falls in the right time period. And potentially, I think Cambridge can row for longer at Ely than Oxford can at Wallingford. We can do eight to 10 kilometer pieces without having to stop or spin. And I don't know if that's the case. Yeah, they've got you can, too, but, they've got but that what I but will also tricky. throw out is that Ox, and, and this is not an excuse for Oxford's yeah. results, but Oxford have had such impeded time on the water yeah. um, in terms of kind of being able to row um, because of the flooding and things like that. And Alan was saying that like one of the things he really, really wanted to do when he come in was like make it fun and make it enjoyable. And one of those things is not schlepping because they can now access Caversham by paying yeah. part of UBC, but it's like an hour and a bit one way. And like, and actually to go and basically do a five, six hour round trip for like 20K is actually probably doesn't quite always fall into that making it fun. Um, yeah. And so I think that's that's been a challenge they've had to navigate and it's no excuse. It's the reality of of just where you train. Um, but I do think that's that's been tough, especially when you have a degree to do on top of that. Sure, for yeah. that timing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't I don't necessarily know the answer. Um, but I think it's something that the Cambridge coaches are all very aligned on and have been for a number of years about what that base pace should look like and how it should win you the race. I think we spoke to a lot of people and I, I would at this point like process versus outcome and again we've like asked questions like what do you think about what do you do what do you do when you're down like process 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 and, like find me a high performance winner that isn't process driven in the moment I think Cambridge are doing that really well I mean anyone mm-hmm. who can sit a length down for like three minutes and then come back and row through yeah. like it's a rare thing to do. I also just think like with Cambridge's coaches having so much experience in this event, they kind of found a different way to, to row it than Oxford. And it looks like Oxford have got like some adapting to do, especially like obviously in the, in the last almost 10 years, there's been such a huge Cambridge domination. I don't think that comes out of nowhere. It should be pretty even between Oxford and Cambridge. We're obviously talking about student rowing here. I I genuinely think Cambridge just has has a bit of a different understanding of of, of that race. They row it more like a five eight k mm. something like this. It's all about the long rhythm. I I don't fund. I don't really agree. I think that um, we're specifically talking about the women here. Like I think that had there not been any kind of incident, I I don't think we would be saying that Oxford rowed two different kind of races. I think I think they really got thrown out of their rhythm. It it maybe gone in their heads or whatever and. I think had Cambridge just rode through, pulled in front, and they both carried on rowing, I don't think the margin would have been as big. Mm. And I think probably they would have had more length than getting in on the rise. Like, I think they were, like, hesitating. Um, but I just, like, like 10 years since my boat race, mm-hmm. Rob Baker was the coach 10 years ago. And bear in mind, it's only, this is the ninth boat race for the women on the Tideway. So yeah. it's still a big learning curve. But, like, Rob Baker was there, and I can't remember when he went to them. He he moved across and Paddy came in. Uh, his first season with the men was the 2019 boat race. Yeah. Okay. So then, so we're talking about, so like five boat races, admittedly a pandemic and one at Ely, but like the training was similar mm-hmm. um, to crews. So whereas Oxford's has Christine Wilson and then there was Ali and I can't remember her surname. Um, and then there was Andy Nelda and now we've got um, Alan. And so like transition is hard. Like, and I think that's also something to, to, to kind of, be aware of and like that there's been significant change in the women's squad um and i think that's that's something to kind of to flag and i also just want to take a moment just to say like ella stadler who's been the president this year um i think she spoke really classily kind of um in the boat race kind of interview straight after um yeah. yeah and she um she's you know she's held down the fort in a big way like being president they they don't really you know you just see them a little bit on the coverage but they do so much for the club it's very much like a sort of captaincy role mm. in in kind of a, a well in a boat club or in a football club or anything like that and she 
she's kind of really kind of um, steadied the ship as they had kind of Alan coming in because Alan didn't actually start working with the squad full time until January because he had to serve his notice with Reading Bluecoat. And he was saying in the first week he got the Oxford job, uh, he got the job, he handed in his notice, he moved house and he had a baby. Like he's had a big year. And so, you know, there's transition is big. <laughs> That's the thing. I'm not, I'm not taking away anything from Oxford at all. I just think with the coaches, when Alan's going to have a few years of experience under his belt, I think it's going to be a lot more like mm. matched between the between the two crews but i absolutely agree like transition just takes time it takes more than a year to develop a system yeah definitely yeah okay let's talk about the men's race then uh again another win by cambridge uh again oxford being the favorites going into it um we said earlier verdict 3.5 links is a 0.6 percent so it's close um i mean it was close on the water anyway um thoughts on that then I, it seemed a bit like uh, power versus experience or something like that. Mm-hmm. Cambridge had six returning blues uh, and Oxford had much more proper international experience. Um, and yeah, it was a classy race, I think. Um, super exciting. There was clashing. There was some really good steering, actually, I think, mm-hmm. in this one. Um, or despite the clashing off the start, I'd say it's probably the cleanest of the races yeah, after weirdly. after they kind of came apart in that point. Um, but, I mean, it kept you guessing all the way to the end when Matt Edge started um, taking yeah. taking Ugh. teaspoonfuls of water yeah. rather than uh, all strokes. There's yeah. an element of, yeah, this is another one where I was like, <laughs> I don't know, I was like, ethically towards the end, I was like, can we call it now? Is he okay? So, like uh, he has prior. Okay. All right. So it wasn't completely out of the blue. All right. I do think if Cambridge had been down, things would have been worse, but they were up. Uh, and I think Ed Bracey managed it really well. Luca Ferraro at seven has stroked a boat race and won it before. And, and he was, did it again. And so, <laughs> so <laughs> you know, I, I think Matt Edge... I watched him take the first dodgy stroke about the RNLI lifeboat station okay. with eight minutes left to row. Oh, yeah. And by the time they hit the bandstand, he was not at full length. He was not. Uh, which is yeah. is quite frankly incredible. Um, but I think they managed that as well as they could. I think their cocks knew they had enough margin and Matt had just enough brain power left to know just don't crab. Mm. At this point, I don't need to put any power down. I just need to not catch an overhead crab and pass out in this boat. Mm. Um, and they fully dived for home on the inside of that bend. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I oh, mean, I, I actually just think like what? fair play, Ed, because... Yeah. What are you saying, Mr. Cox? <gasps> oh, oh my God. gosh. Because I think... Because also probably, you know, we at the point that we noticed that he was basically dribbling. Yeah. Um, like, like... <laughs> You know, Ed will have seen that a minute before and been like, "Oh no, oh no, oh no." <laughs> um, I can I can thankfully say that I've never had that in my uh, oh how many years, kind of fourteen years of rowing or anything that I've had quite had that kind of extreme level. But um, yeah, I think I think it would be basically reassurance yeah. um, at that point and knowing that you, like you need to do the right the right things essentially to kind of get them across the line but I com- I completely agree I the kind of I think Will Negri did a very good job that the Oxford Cox I think he probably could have pulled them out of their puddles a tiny bit he was maybe pulling them he was maybe a little bit tight just once they had properly got up to just you know it's really hard when you're getting those puddles washing down because you're just not feeling like you're gripping up but like I'm being really finickety here like I think I think it was really well Cox um on on both sides but yeah I so like the Oxford men, I've seen them kind of rowing and they, they've been down at Caversham. They did some pieces with kind of like the men's eight and things like that. Yeah, it definitely felt, um, I don't know, I think like the style in which they were kind of bringing them together, it was kind of maybe, sometimes it's a slightly like compromise style. Like it's almost like when you put like an under 23 eight together sometimes and you're like, okay, you write this, you write like this and like, let, let's do a blend. And like some days I see them and then I was like, oh yeah, they got that. That's really good. And other days it just wasn't quite there for them. Um, but yeah, like I'm really good. There's a couple of like, I mean, Harry Glenister is 
just one of the nicest men in rowing. And so I'm, I'm just really gutted for him because I really, really wanted him to get the win. Um, he's just a lovely guy we know back up from Leander. But um, I think a really classy row from Cambridge, to be honest. I think they just looked like they were rowing better. Yeah. Uh, I did wonder whether that clashing was um, on Matt Edge's blade early in that race. And the clashings happened early as well. Mm. Um, and if anyone's ever been in a blade clash, you know that you are filled with adrenaline when that's happening and you're you're going 100 miles an hour trying to make sure you don't crab and you're still rowing well and you're at stroke trying to set the rhythm for this whole race uh, and I do wonder whether that might have played a part in that massive spike of adrenaline so early them having to go so deep to make sure they could break contact mm. and then realizing oh uh-oh <laughs> I'm crashing like maybe that adrenaline wears off I've pushed really really hard to get us in this position how much do I have left? Yeah. It looked like Cambridge just like worked their way through Oxford so much. And then the stroke just literally just did everything he could. It's just like yeah. spent, won the race. <laughs> I'm checking <laughs> out. But yeah, but fair play for not catching a crab. Like literally talk about half conscious rowing, muscle yeah. memory. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah was... I think from my memory as well, I can think of Felix Drinkle, Alex Wood, no. Seb, the German guy back in 2003, all of whom have done similar things, either mm. passing out just after the race or mid-race in terms of 2003. Mm -hmm. And all of those crews have lost. Mm. So I think a massive kudos for holding it together for the win uh, when you're basically rowing a 7++ plus plus for the last four minutes. Yeah. Seeing the way he was rowing, I was like, yeah, he's yeah. like, I was like, he's going to catch a crab. Like, he's going to catch a crab and this is going to end. And like, so you just hope Seven and Cox is like, just ghost it, just yeah. in yeah. and yeah, yeah, out, yeah, yeah, yeah. in and out. At one point I was like, should he just pull it in? Like, <laughs> should he just pull it in? Like, yeah. He could try and sit the boat, but he's going to get... And he's yeah. going to get hit in the back. And, and if he stops... Yeah. 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 not good for his head just to do that. Yeah. Really I was yeah. like, maybe just pull him in, like the coxes, pull him into your seat with me. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, oh, bless him. Oh, <laughs> swap, swap, swap. Yeah, get the yeah, in. yeah. <laughs> oh, that would be sick. <laughs> the start of that race, I, one of the things I did want to highlight was how early athletes in that Oxford crew started looking round when they were down. Oh, yeah. I really... I they were half that. a length down and stroke seat and seven seat started taking looks over their I shoulder. I saw stroke seat as well, yeah. And that's not what you want, right? Mm -hmm. Like in my head, eyes in, heads in, you trust your cocks to tell you where yeah. you are. Mm -hmm. They weren't even a length down, you know, and they're taking glances trying to figure out where yeah. Cambridge are. For it me, doesn't... it's not what you're missing by looking round. It's and it lack wasn't of the trust. people that were clashing either, yeah. right? You get a free pass, look at your blade, yeah. make sure it's going in square, but it wasn't, they weren't in that class. It's the lack of trust in the cocks. Like if you can't trust what he's saying right now, yeah. You're broadcasting lack of confidence, essentially, yeah. while looking around. Yeah. I did want to, what I was amazed by, talking about Coxon's credit, Yes, there was a few clashes early on, but then, like, again and again and again, Matt Pinson stands up with the flag and then just holds it there. And it, like, again, and he said, both crews move apart, both crews move apart, but he didn't warn anyone. Like, they literally sat on a center line, two feet away from each other for minutes. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. that's impressive. Imaginary. It went up line. again. Both crews move apart. Yeah. But, and then, yeah, and there was yeah. no warning. There it's, was no warning. It's really interesting, yeah. like, there's I think they're like you know it's what I was talking about a little bit with the Oxford stuff like um the, the reason why obviously I'm going to say this but you need a cox uh in those bigger boats is is that like not everyone's putting e in an ideal world everyone's putting exactly the same what's down for exactly the same amount of minutes for all of that time but like that's not how it happens obviously you've got really active water underneath you you've got all these other things as well you've got the rudder coming on like someone takes a mummy stroke like actually we should probably also um credit ed with the fact that he still managed to actually steer whilst he was having a four and a three like basically he completely lost thankfully it wasn't actually someone in the bows yeah. because that would really mm -hmm. make an impact on the rudder um but yeah like that takes that takes kind of a lot of guts to basically sit there um because there is there is the like, should I move? Should it be me? Should it be me? Should it be me? Am I in the right place? I'm not sure. And that's while they're also delivering the race plan and doing all those sorts of things as well. So like, um, I think that that comes from, to be honest, a lot of experience. Morgan Bayman Williams, her favorite phrase, and obviously she's out in the States at the moment where they have a bazillion eights going along one side by side is fleet management. <laughs> and we don't do a lot of fleet management in the UK, partly because the width of our rivers that we train on 
Um, and the fact that, you know, our boat clubs aren't hundreds and hundreds deep with, you know, 15 coxes having to run side by side. The only thing you really get is those random Brooks wibble ball videos, basically, when you've got all those smashing alongside. Um, and so, yeah, I'd say Brooks Scotch is probably pretty good at their old fleet management, but I do think that is, um, you know, a real skill of coxes. Um, and it's something that doesn't get tested all that much. Like I could, I could tell you on one hand in the last five or six years, the times I've basically been side by side with another cox having to manage having it yeah. to actually manage it in open water so i think that's another kind of thing to really credit both of those coxes with is like you say that's it's a huge learning curve for coxes that uh come trial for cambridge and i'm sure it's the same for the wallingford stretch as well the ely stretch is just wide enough for three eights across and at the start of the year you can't get three eights in two eight two eights and they're going to be yeah, yeah. kind of snaking that kind of thing figuring out where straight is figuring out what adjustments they can make to be parallel because it's not something people have experience with uh, and they get so much better over the course of the season uh, just on the both crews move apart that's another interesting boat race rules thing yeah, yeah. when that flags up like that both crews move apart it means that if a foul occurs you got to abide by your own mistakes if that means any clashing any touching is happening in that neutral water mm-hmm. and if that negatively affects you that's your fault. Okay. Mm. So he's almost like it's a good it's a good thing to listen to that yeah. because you're yeah, not yeah, taking yeah. advantage. It means you don't have to move, but if something goes wrong, on your head be it. On your head be it. Yeah. No. And like that's something to say. You know, obviously it, we saw it a little bit with Phelps having that conversation with Joe at the end. Like, you know, they will have umpires briefings beforehand. Like, you know, well in advance who your umpire is going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll have those umpires briefings. You'll kind of. Yeah, you know, it's not it's not unfamiliar, and there's there's like ten rules of the boat race. There's not actually that many. It's it's kept pretty simple, and 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 you know, it's knowing knowing what the rules are and things like that, and that and that is a, a key skill. And it's not just the responsibility of the coxes as well. It's it's for the rowers because a little bit like in a Henley Henley race, if you are getting warned, they could be quite a way back, and you rely on your stroke to be telling you what to do. So you know, luckily for Ed, um, he didn't need Matt yeah, to tell him actually, anything. <laughs> in, the, in the men's boat race, actually, um, you can catch it in the footage. There's a there's a little bit of the camera behind Ed's head so you can see Matt Edge and the rest of the crew. Um, and it's when they're up, probably just after the steps, that kind of area. And you can just see Matt Edge go that to, the, to Ed to say, you, you've got enough space. You've got over half a length. You can move in front of them. Yeah. I thought that was a really cool mm. thing for the footage to catch. That's some yeah. of the detail that you that you spot if you've yeah, been there. Of course. <laughs> yeah, it's well. I really actually miss coxing in a bow loader, like because I have no. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm in a bow loader, and yeah. being in the stern loader, you don't have that like relationship with yeah. um with sure. the stroke, and and like you know they will have been they've been in that combo from pretty much most of the fixtures and all that sort of thing. So they'll have that kind of that level of relationship down where he can just be like, go on push it over <laughs> and like and you know they know exactly what that means there's something uh telepathic about the stroke yeah like, yeah so in an age yeah <laughs> when you're like you can you when you see the cox is like having a look and you're like oh my god they're, they're gonna say we need to go and like we yeah, need to go yeah. like, <laughs> oh <wow. laughs> you can kind of see it before it happens yeah um so from oxford being favorites of that men's boat race i thought actually cambridge put it to bed quite quickly mm. Mm. i i expected them to go head to head a little bit um for a little bit longer, especially with like all that Blake clash with having Lenny Jenkins and Harry Glenster in a boat. That was a little bit surprising. Again, I think what you Imogen said, it was like experience versus power. They, the Cambridge, bit. Cambridge just knew how to row that race better. The guys have so much trust in Rob Baker and what he's doing. Um, that I think they are, they are always a hundred percent committed to making something greater than some of their parts. Um, and, it looked to me a little bit like, especially when things got difficult for the Oxford boat, it became quite individual mm. um, in looking round and you, you know how it is. If one person tries to make a personal push, it's not going to, mm. not going to do anything. Um, and I wonder if there was a little bit of that, like, oh my God, we're down. It doesn't feel good. Maybe if I push harder, it'll help. Oh no, that's not helping. And it kind of starts to disintegrate at that point. But it looked to me like the Cambridge men were just a continual cohesive unit the whole way. Yeah, I agree. It's not as simple as this, but it seems to be like the tale of almost all the races that I watched was was Oxford had the ability to move very fast, very quickly, make big changes, get off the start very fast. But Cambridge was just like an inch of stroke, an inch of stroke. Just yeah. Consistency. And like, you've got to think that that would be the tactic in a 20 minute race. Yeah. And um, there's different styles as well, right? Like once you've been in rowing for long enough, 
you can recognize the difference in styles mm. between Oxford and Cambridge. And I think they are quite polar opposite. Yeah. Mm. Um, and in my experience, I think it might be simplistic, but I think the Oxford style is quite easy to coach. And I think it comes together really quickly. So I think they get quite good results in the fixtures and early in the season. And it looks punchy and it feels powerful and it feels good. And the Cambridge style takes a bit longer. And it can be a bit stressful when you're getting to the fixtures and you're still not going fast enough, <laughs> but you've got to trust. And I think it can only just fit in that seven month period to kind of coach that style and get everyone rowing in the same way. But I think that improvement curve that they get in the final month, even final four weeks, you know, is is really big. Mm. Um, and I do wonder whether that's part of the reason that both uh, blue boats for men and women were able, were able to overturn being the underdog and mm. actually come through to win. Yeah, it looked like that rhythm just basically carried them through and that's just trust in the system. Erin, if you're in the Oxford team now, in the coaching team, what would you be looking to change or to, to sort of like overturn the tide even more for the next years? I mean, I think the women's program are in a good place. Like, I think it's quite exciting what they're doing. They've got kind of a good uh, yeah, kind of consistency coming from James with, with kind of Alan coming in and bringing some new ideas and things like that. Um, I think on the Oxford side, it's, it's it's tricky. Like, obviously, Sean has been in post for a really, really long time. 30 years. Yeah, that long. Like, nearly as old as me. <laughs> and um, Older than me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah shush. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, babies. We're older than rich. Um, and um, I think, I don't know. I think, I think it's really tricky. Like, when someone's been in post for a really long time, they have so much intellectual property. Like, they, they know. And, you know, we know he knows how to win, but obviously... You know he's he's not won in a number of years, and obviously the twenty two was was needed uh, for Oxford, but it's it's not it's not quite there yet. Um, so that's kind of one for for all of them to kind of deal with. I don't want to get want to go there with that with a barge bottle, but like what I would also say is obviously it wasn't um it wasn't a great row from ISIS in the end. Um, but Brendan, who is um that second coach um at Oxford, is a really good eights coach. Like and and he is he is a really good um. I think he's a really good kind of second in command. Like he's done the eight for uh, under twenty threes for the last number of years. Has fantastic success, and um, I do think there'll be an element as well of like people might want to come to Oxford um, for kind of Brendan and, and what he can bring to the boat as well. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see to see where it goes. Really, yeah. I mean, is Sean going to start teaching them how to pick up the front a bit more on a twenty minute race? Because that's certainly going to add some speed. That's what's needed from the outside. It will add some speed. I think, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna tie myself in knots on that one. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's really interesting, isn't it? Like, you know, like I think the boat race is a little bit more like football managers more than anything else. Like mm -hmm. it can be a little bit like, ah, throw them out, like, you know, and, and, um, but then there is also always that flip side of like, is it time? Like, is it time yeah. to move on? And, and, I, I don't know the answer to that question, we, really. We talked about it last year with the women's squad, obviously. Um, Andy's lost six. A lot of people are saying, is it time for him to go? Um, I don't think they didn't decide till very late, although as, as, as I'm aware, he, he made that decision quite late. One of the reasons why Alan was chosen quite late. Um, and we sort of answered the question, like, what, like, is it time to get rid of him? And I think we sort of said, one of the things you've got to understand is like, you can replace him, but it's not going to change in a year. Yeah. It's a short season mm -hmm. anyway. You're going to have missed so many other things. And like, I don't know anyone who doesn't like Alan, who knows him, like from his athletes who've trained under him. I know some of the Brooks girls and anyone who's worked with him. We have as well at Reading Blue Coats. And um, he's been in there a really short time. They've had not a lot of water time. Um, other than the fact that we'd started to hear that Oxford was becoming a favor, mm. favorite. For me, it was like, this is such a building year for him. Like, he's really not got anything to lose, like, apart from a horrific, you know, anything like close or competitive would be great for him, great building. So it's almost maybe got skewed by the fact that, oh, no, they were the favorites, and they, but they didn't win. Yeah. Yeah. But I think everything underneath is still, is still looking yeah. good. I think Sean's definitely too valuable to just let go. He brings, like you said, so much more to the boat club than just managing of the boat race, but possibly the technical model has evolved over the last eight years, and that's what needs to be looked at. But certainly, when, you, when you're when you basically an intellectual property of a club, you still need to be a part of it. I don't think there's like a clean cut or anything like that, and I wouldn't advocate for that either. But like you say, but we've said like he has such a distinctive style, such a distinctive way of doing things. He's been doing it for so long, and that's the way he does it. And like you said, aside from 22, it doesn't look like what he's doing is is 
as competitive as it has been in the past with mm. what Cambridge are doing. Yeah. Does with, that mean he is he happy to make changes or do you get rid of him? I don't know the answer to that question. Mm. Um, this year is the first year he's now ne- negative in terms of wins. He's lost more boat races than he has won in his 30-year career. Uh, I think it's also worth saying Rob Baker joined CUWBC. I think his first race was 2014. And his first win wasn't until the reserve race that I was in in 2016. And his first blue boat win wasn't until 2017. And that's how long it took to build that system. And if we'd booted him out, who knows? Like, what would the last eight years have looked like? It would have been so, so different. Um, But I feel like at this point, what Cambridge has really shown is that they can win with Olympians in the boat and they can win with college rowers in the boat. There's a system that develops every athlete up. Um, all the way down to the spares and through the reserves. Um, I think there's a really big belief that the whole point is to get each athlete to be the best that they can be and make make each boat the best that they can be. And I think probably that luxury only comes from having an established system for a while and building that culture and building that momentum. Um, and I, I mean, for as a Cambridge supporter, it's been a privilege to watch build since 2016 with its first win. Yeah, I think like one of the reasons the boat race is so watched and is so interesting is is there's always another one, you know. It always goes again and it yeah. carries on and that that's what's really cool about it, um but also really brutal about it, you know, and it, it's it's very much like you know, there's one big focus and then we move on and and I think so like I was talking to Johnny Searle at the boat race dinner and he was like, "Well, you know these things come in waves." And he was like, "And I remember there was a time and I was very lucky to be, you know, when I was doing my bro race in that point, like in 2014, it was a clean sleep sweep for Oxford. And, you know, I was like, woohoo, this is how it is. Right. And, you know, and then the, yeah. Yeah. we said it right, how many times, but like, you know, things change and the tide turns and then it's, it's going Cambridge way for a little bit. So that's kind of what makes it good. You know, it, it keeps, it keeps it going and, and people, people come back hungry and, and whether you want to, when once you want to win again or, or, or vice versa, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. Go on. I think for me personally, as much as I, I do enjoy watching the Cambridge way of rowing, I do hope that Oxford are going to pick up some speed and the tide's going to change a little bit for a while because I do want this event to be like competitive and keep going and provide excitement every year. Yeah. Well, we're not exactly going to know what's happened. So you but can only was. have a good boat race with two quality teams. Yeah. And as someone that's raced a bunch of boat races and was very lucky to have a lot of success in them. It's also the fact that after you're done, actually, you have a lot in common with your opponent as well. You know, like I I go into a crowded room and I see a lightweight men's blazer for Oxford and I know that I've got something in common with them. Mm. And that goes for the Cambridge blazers and the Oxford blazers. And it's that community. It's the boat race as a whole, I think. Genuinely, you might be rivals the entire time you're at university, but it's Oxbridge for a reason yeah, and yeah. that that legacy really runs deep yeah i think it's it's an event where the 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 race is a is a bigger enemy than the opposition mm. you both yeah. know that what's going to hurt the most is doing mm. that race and it's not really what you know it's not because i hate him you know the worst yeah. bit is that race and you kind of like to galvanize together in that in terms of that i think it's also worth mentioning that i think it is probably one of the most stressful coaching jobs you could ever have yeah. the fact that sean's been there for 30 years is insane yeah like it's one race win or you've failed and it's very easy to say he's lost a few recently and maybe he's gone into the negative in those total numbers but again we spoke so much about how a lot of the cambridge wins are have come through experience and you can't kind of bet against his experience. It's it's interesting. Maybe I'm just a bit of a high stakes person. But when I went out in the in the launch with Alan, like I I don't think probably kind of rowing coaching is my long term future. You know, I I I enjoy being round by the river, but I don't think I'm probably that's that's why I'm looking career wise. But I was in the launch and I was like, oh, I'd love your job. <laughs> that's probably the only coaching job I probably I think I would enjoy. But maybe that just shows I'm a bit of a risk taker. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm the opposite. Like, no, thank you. Uh, <laughs> oh, it looks, it looks really stressful. I mean, going on that kind of the race as the enemy, I, I've always said, it's not that I want Oxford to lose ever. Yeah. It's that I want Cambridge to win. And I think it's subtle, but I think that's so important. It's ne- I never want an Oxford crew to have a really bad time. I just want I want us to 
I want us to win. I don't want them to lose. Yeah, like, and I think I think that's where it comes down to. Obviously, we've had a bit of a debate about like the, the women's race and all of that, well, that sort of thing. But I think I think what we're all very agreed on is that we want everyone to have done their best. Yeah, and obviously, just we want one crew's best to be better than the other ones. <laughs> but like, you know, that that is fundamentally what it what it is all about. And and I think just going into what you were saying about like the commonality of it, the reality is is that um like so few people really understand what it actually takes to do a boat race like you know you could just flick onto the bbc on easter saturday and be like oh that's nice but like the like the kind of the the intensity that you're actually training for um you know these people are doing like media interviews all the sort of thing the majority of them have never done anything like this before and so i wanted to credit a couple of the ones who did the interviews after who were so poised mm. who spoke and articulated and represented themselves and their clubs really really well like the pressure from your tutors I remember in my boat race oh, yeah. year I I'd started at college rowing and you have a meeting with your master every year just it's like three or four minutes or something and I had a meeting with the master in my third year and my and my tutor and he was like no Aaron I'm very pleased that you're not doing any college rowing this year because I do think you really focus on the thing and I was like yes I am not doing any college rowing this year <laughs> Like, because I'm actually doing the voters and I was thinking, when are those headshots coming out? Because I'm going to be in so much trouble. But like, it's huge. Like, yeah. And I, I haven't even spoken about the academic demands, but I mean, it's yeah. that constant undercurrents. Yeah. Like, you forget that these people are in labs or on placements or in lectures. Every single natural scientist student at Cambridge has to miss their Saturday lectures every week, every year of their degree, because natural scientists are one of the only subjects that do lectures on Saturdays and that's when we row. And the only reason they can get through that successfully is because there's years and years and years of previous people who have done boat races and missed those lectures and got those notes and they help mm -hmm. each other. Nice. You know, and like that academic thing is always this undercurrent and I don't really think it's spoken about enough no. to be honest because it, it's quite frankly incredible. How many morning session, early morning sessions end up in being in a, a lab nap? afterwards <laughs> so, I mean, like, you might I, be present in the lecture but you're not there i just didn't go to many um i did the opposite yeah but you were doing a real degree <laughs> <laughs> i did history and english i remember so um so, uh, so uh we used to do early early mornings so we'd leave at 5 45 um from ifley and we would drive to wallingford and come back and, you know, bless them, like, you know, the medics and the, the scientists were going directly to labs. And I remember a few times I'd go to the English faculty library, which is kind of north-ish Oxford. And I remember, like, the first few times turning up at nine and then, like, someone letting me in and being like, hello. I was like, is it open? They're like, yeah, but, like, it's, like no one's here before <laughs> 11. Like, they were just putting all the books away and stuff. And they, it was so weird. Or in the Radcliffe camera, which is a big, beautiful kind of round library um, in Oxford, there was some really precious seats which had like a big radiator next to you and you were right next to the window and no one would sit next to you because they were like one opposite each other. And then me and one of the other girls um, would basically cycle, be there for nine. And then uh, you could dry all your kit on the radiator next to you whilst you were working and everyone's just looking at you judging. But yeah, it is. It is just, it's a huge demand. It's it's huge. And like, I mean, I was chatting to... um Annie and Joe, who are the um, uh, the the stroke and the cox of of the blue boat, and they're both graduate medics, yep. and you know, first years this year, right? yeah, 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 and they were kind of like discussing medicine, <laughs> it's like their stuff, and like you know, and they've got this, and they've got, and they were basically, like, oh, this is the first, the only break that they'll have because then after that, there's no holidays and all of this and it is it's, I think as it's well, insane like, you work it back even further like most people who go for Oxford and Cambridge are starting to think about that from like maybe the age of 13 14 there's certainly like GCSE starting to like make sure you've got your extracurricular and your all that other stuff you've made it you've got in you've done all this work and now you're going to make your degree like twice as difficult if not more by then adding rowing to it and I think it makes me laugh when people are like oh it's just a race it's not the end of the world like if you're in that race you have made it your world mm. if you're lucky for a year potentially for three or four like it does become rowing does become your world because you don't have time for anything else and yeah. i think that's what makes it like yeah crazy yeah. cambridge has done uh, a study on their elite athlete population so the university rowing clubs like the university rugby clubs a bunch of them basically people who get blues half blues do a lot of training um and when they published their results they showed that 
the elite athletes at Cambridge do better in their degrees on average. They get more firsts, they get more T1s. Um, and I think that's always the best sell to be like, look, you can do like, it. you know, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. And yeah. like, these people are the busiest people on on the campus. Yeah. Right. I remember my, my uh, the master of my college when we first started said, you can choose two things to do while you're here. Don't go to all the clubs, do two things. And one of them must be your studies. <laughs> Pretty much. We okay. chose wrong. <laughs> yes, we did. Well, when you have when you have limited time, you're gonna make every second count. So if all your time, all your spare time is taken up by all the training, then you have no choice but to just get all your all your uni studies. Yeah. The only other thing I think then before we finish is to mention that next year will be post Olympic year. Mm. Um, so that can change things. So recruitment is going to be really important. If 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 it's not already being, I'm sure it is already being done. Um, any thoughts on that? I see on how a post Olympic year. <laughs> Yeah, saying nothing. You don't have to. Look, if anyone wants to pay for me to do an MBA, I'd like to do another one, okay? Um, as long as it's at Cambridge, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> look, look, if the money's there. <laughs> um, yeah, no, uh, I actually, I I know of some people who might be going, but I'm not going to no, disclose not that here because I that's, don't know. But um, Just I think in general terms. It yeah. generally, like, it makes a really interesting dynamic. Um, I think, like, what is really cool and unique about the boat race is, is you know, you're not going to end up with a full boat stack full of internationals. Generally speaking, there's always some people who've come up through college rowing or, or, or stuff like that. Like I remember in my first, my year, Malcolm Howard, a Canadian giant man, uh, was uh, the president of the men. And it was just like really cool, like as a college rower, just being like, wow. And he was, he's the nicest guy. Um, so I think it adds a really interesting dynamic, but um, I think it doesn't take away from kind of the way the club's culture is. And I actually think that the best people who are running the clubs, and I think we've got some really good people in post, basically they're not treated any differently. You train, you erg, and it's great to have some natural leaders in the boat, but you know, their style, what they've been doing might not fit yeah. what, you know, the coach is trying to get out of it. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I I definitely think there's going to be some stacked eights next year. I think I, I've spoken to a number of people who have applied. I'm not going to be listing any names no. because offers aren't out yet. Interviews aren't out yet. Um, obviously trying to sell Cambridge, but to be honest, I want anyone to have boat race experience. And honestly, if that means going to Oxford, fair play, because <laughs> I, I genuinely think it's that cool and that fun. There's no other place where you get to row with different nationalities. Yeah. You don't get that melting pot of experience anywhere else. And it's so, so special. And for me, my first two years in the blue boat, I was the only person without international experience those years. And then when I came back in 2022, I was one of the Olympians. And being able to see it from both of those sides was just amazing. Because in both of those situations, right, I was a college rower in the first time. And there were college rowers in my boat when I was the big dog. And just being able to be like, oh, well, when we did it, we did it like this. And to hear Grace say, oh, when we did it, we did it like this. Or to listen to Melissa and Holly in 2017, who just missed out on the Rio team the year before saying, oh, well, this is how we did that. This is how we did that. It's such a rich environment. And I just want people to experience it. That's amazing. That sounds amazing. I want to go. <laughs> Come on, you said, yeah, see, look, we're telling them. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. So, guys, thanks so much for this episode. I think we've covered more than I could have hoped for. And we've had, we've brought some absolute real fire to, to what has happened a couple of days ago. Thank you so much for your time. And we're going to have to get you back on again at some point. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having us. No, I really appreciate it. An amazing insight. Um, we picked the right people, obviously, to talk about this. It was, it was really fun. Um, yeah, again, I'm sure, I'm sure maybe in a year's time we'll come back even with you and a few more. We'll do a bit, bit of a bigger panel, but no, that's was, was really good. Thanks so much for for giving your time yeah cool and that concludes everything for this episode so on that note e Ray for Cambridge <laughs> <laughs> cue the tabs <laughs> easy there <laughs> cue the music <laughs>